Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast presented by the Chargers Podcast Network. My name is Steven, and I'm the host, and uh, joining me is my guy, Tyler, as always. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Uh, I'm not wearing tights. And Jim, I love the whole bring in the storm thing, but if you could send it back, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the weather's been uh, been uh, delightful, shall we say, over the last few weeks here in in California. So got a lot to dive into today regarding Mr. Joe Hortiz and his press conference. A lot of great takeaways uh, that we will have some some fun things to talk about. Um, you know, as we kind of, you know, transition from the hiring process into, okay, now do, what does this all look like? What does this all, you know, come together as, um, I thought Joe was fantastic today and, uh, really excited to dive into that. As always, Tyler and I are fans of the team, just like you guys. Um, the opinions that we share on this show are just that they're our opinions, not the opinions of the organization themselves. We're very grateful to have this platform and be able to express those opinions and hopefully, you guys have uh, continued to enjoy the show. So uh, as always, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff really does help us out. And uh, feel free to go throw us a subscription over on our own channel, the Get the Charge podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all that good stuff wherever you find your podcast. That being said, Tyler, uh, let's dive into this press conference with Mr. Joe Hortiz today, officially introduced as Chargers general manager. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of joked offhand about some of the the funny moments here i thought the the story where uh i i don't think this was actually public knowledge but joe mentioned that he met jim harbaugh before john harbaugh uh when jim was a player for the baltimore ravens and and they shared a a competitive heated racquetball match uh you know where jim kind of uh cooked joe in the racquetball uh department so i'd be curious to see if they could maybe replicate that Racquetball is not super popular anymore. Maybe pickleball might be their front, especially in Southern California. Um, but that was a funny moment. But Tyler, uh, let's get to the serious matters here. What was kind of your your big takeaway, you know, generality, uh, you know, philosophy, maybe a point of his that you just really gravitated towards from today's press conference? Yeah, how about the words cycle of comp picks? That's something that we wanted throughout this process for the next general manager to have and to have a plan for. And yeah. They got that. The cycle of comp picks. How nice was that to hear as a Chargers fan? And it's not a passive process. It's one that is ongoing, and it's a process that understands how to maximize the number of picks and protect those picks, too, and ensure that you get as many as possible. Uh, You pointed out the last time that we were streaming together that the Ravens have had 53 comp picks since 1995. Uh, The next closest is the Packers with 43 And if you look at the top five teams over the past about 30 years, the top five teams in terms of comp picks are the Ravens, the Packers, the Patriots, the Cowboys, and the Steelers. That is 13 championships over that span. The Chargers, no championships, uh, fifth fewest with just 14 in about 30 years. Uh, Two of the teams behind them are the Texans, who weren't a franchise until 2002, and the Browns, who didn't have football return back to Cleveland until 1999 so the idea that the Chargers are going to have even just one or two more at bats in each draft is outstanding and really exciting one because we love the pre-draft process and we loved the draft and finding those gems but two because look even if you have a 50 percent hit rate which is still really good but even if you only hit on every other pick having two more means you're going to hit on one of those picks you're going to find another starter you're going to find another Jamari Sawyer or for them like a Geno Stone you're going to find somebody else in the draft who's going to become a really solid piece for your team. And that's so critical for the Chargers moving forward with Justin Herbert's contract. Yeah, as, as you move into this era where your quarterback is no longer on a rookie contract, you have to be able to hit on the draft at a higher rate. That's been one of the key successes of the – of not the Patriots, excuse me. It was a success of the Patriots dynasty. It, it's one of the successes currently of the Kansas City Chiefs and like how many – you know, young players have been on that defense in particular, um, have played, you know, specific roles in, in their playoff stretches. So, you know, having more at-bats is, is certainly crucial. I, I think there's a few layers here to dive into from his team building philosophy that he mentioned. Um, you know, he, he said, first of all, I'm a big fan of comp picks. Uh, he talked about comp picks four different times in this press conference, unprompted. Like, it's not like somebody was like, hey, like, What's your philosophy on comp picks? Like it was just unprompted. And every time he talked about comp picks, he smiled like he like he loves comp picks. And I think it 
he understands how much of a cheat code it can be for your franchise. Um, but the specific quote here too, I think it, it is interesting. You know, he says, let's create that cycle of comp picks. How do you do that? You gain as many picks as you can early, and then you draft, develop, and then make smart decisions on who you resign. So I thought that was an interesting draft nugget potentially of let's get as many picks as we can this year. I've said before, like if I were Joe Ortiz, my goal would have it make at least 10 selections this year. And there's a realistic path towards them doing that. They'll have their own seven. They're getting an, a, an additional seventh round pick for the Drew Tranquil contract. And then you can find a way to trade around, maybe trade some players. But I thought that was an interesting thing that like right away, he's like, I want to get as many picks as I can in this particular draft, which again, kind of lines up with where the Chargers are at financially with the Justin Herbert contract, with the big four and their future looming. So there are multiple layers to his like, cycle of comp picks but that was one that stood out to me too is is he wants as many picks as possible this year yeah and, and he's going to get that through a variety of ways we were talking recently about looking through the ravens transactions and what they were able to do and i was going to create a spreadsheet and i figured okay you know one per year let's just see like the 12 moves that they might have made over the course of his history with the team and i i got tired my eyes yeah, were starting to, to yeah <laughs> there was a lot to have to go through to sit through because there was, I think since 2011, 43 different transactions the Ravens had made, whether it's trading for a player, trading away a player, trading back, trading up, it doesn't matter. And I love the flexibility that that provides because, you know, the best way, the biggest compliment I can give the Ravens and Joe Ortiz and the operation over there is that I hated how lucky it seemed like they were to always have the right player fall into their laps, but it's not luck. It's designed because they always know how to work the board, you know, and trade back, trade up. They somehow get exactly the players that they want without really having to trade up and only give up value. They find ways to trade back and acquire as well. So not only do they get the players that they want, but they somehow gain picks too. It's a it's a wild process, but that's why the Ravens are so good. Yeah, they they play the board better than anybody. And I think the the fact that the Chargers have somebody, you know, at the helm who can play the board like that is, is certainly um, you know, an advantage, so to speak. Um, I, I think the other side of the compensatory picks thing here that is certainly worth diving into is is how does that affect the Chargers right now this offseason? You know, uh, unfortunately, the Chargers do not have that many free agents that could potentially net them a compensatory pick next year. That list is obviously mostly Austin Eckler and Gerald Everett. Maybe Alohi Gilman is, is a guy who, who could net a compensatory pick in free agency. But if he's really all about compensatory picks, what does that say about the chances of those guys returning? And I think Alohi Gilman, I would say, probably has the best chance of returning because of, of what the needs are on defense. But Jim Harbaugh mentioned that he has spoken to Austin Eckler. He's spoken to everybody on the team, but he mentioned Austin Eckler by name as somebody who had him fired up to talk about ball. And, and Austin Eckler is, you know, he's a great person to talk sports to, talk life to. He has an electric personality. There were some comparisons of Austin Eckler to Blake Corum, who he had at Michigan. Um, so what that does in the short term is pretty interesting as well, because that has like real roster ramifications for this team as well. Well, he also mentioned, Joe Hortiz, I should say, mentioned that the summer signings and the post-draft signings are key there in, in factoring into that. And also the guys that you acquire in season. I mean, they might find a guy who they can acquire in season they give up a pick for that player, have that player with them. Let's say maybe in just that season, that player walks, they get a comp pick back. It's a fascinating formula that they're going to have to weigh. And I think that that's just more ways they can do it. So sure, maybe some players, maybe they retain more players than we think, or maybe even just this year, they retain some more players, try to write the ship. I don't know. Even if they do that, even if they sign some guys, they can still find a way during the summer and even during the season, as Joe mentioned, to get these comp picks in future years. Yeah, and he mentioned like protecting the comp picks with those signings too. Um, and this past season, I mean, how important were the Kyle Van Noy and Jadavion Clowney signings for yep. them? Um, and now those players are potentially leaving and giving the Ravens more compensatory picks. So it's it is really just a cycle of things, um, you know that that Joe Ortiz is is trying to start up here. Obviously, from a draft perspective, like they're not going to get compensatory picks from the guys they draft for some years, but there obviously are some players that 
you know, maybe we have more faith in our ability to draft this guy's replacement. And so this player or X player is able to walk in free agency. So it's uh, it's certainly a different philosophy that the Chargers are going to be employing under Joe Ortiz. And I think it's one that is pretty exciting. Um, I think, you know, kind of adding on to that is, you know, how many times he spoke about being able to kind of turn over every stone as a way to truly like make this team better. And you mentioned a few of those uh, ways, obviously, Tyler, but, you know, he, at the end of his press conference, he was asked about like the Roquan Smith trade. Um, And I thought he gave a really good answer there about being active in the trade market, which obviously the Chargers have not really done in recent years in terms of acquiring talent. But he this was his quote about the Roquan Smith trade and about being active on the trade market. Uh, Quote, you have to be looking to make the team better. If we can find a player leading up to the trade deadline that can help the Chargers now and going forward. Either way, and there are different ways you can trade for a player who ends up factoring into the compensatory formula again. Maybe it's just a loan, or you can trade for a player that you want to retain. I think that there are multiple ways to go for it, but I definitely think that is something that's valuable. Always, we're, we're always going to be looking to make this team better. If that's through trade, then that's through trade, as long as it makes sense for the Chargers. So everything today was about alignment of philosophy and making this team better and exploring every single possible avenue of making this team better. And I just, I, I, it was so refreshing to hear that kind of approach that he's going to do everything possible. He's fully committed to building a winning franchise for this team, for Jim Harbaugh. And he's going to do every single possible thing that he can to make sure that Jim Harbaugh and everybody has the resources that they need. Alignment is so key here with these hirings, the the future hirings, everything that they're, they're going to do. Alignment is so key. And I believe Daniel Popper asked, you know, without giving it away, what is the kind of secret sauce to Baltimore's success? And this is a different, couple of different ways I thought he could have gone with that answer. But he said it was the connection between general manager, head coach, and overall, what he said multiple times throughout the press conference, discussions. And it's about that communication and making sure we understand what we need and the idea that at any point, you know, up until the deadline on draft day in free agency, whatever he can look at Jim Harbaugh can look at George and say, Hey, I need, as Joe pointed out, a a linebacker. I need a backer. The fact that he could just do that and that he will try his best to go out and get that player to make sure that this team is winning or is in a position to win, or maybe again, talking about comp picks that they're lined up for comp picks is really awesome. And I am, I'm very curious, uh, how into this particular season the Chargers are in terms of wanting to go for it all and win a championship with the current roster. Because as, as Joe Ortiz said, they're not mailing in any seasons. They're not going yeah. to just say, hey, well, you know, we'll just do this thing in 2025. We'll see. You know, I think it's easier said than done. That's the right thing to say. Of course, we are, you know, the Chargers are trying to win. Every NFL team is trying to win. But there are definitely more years in front of you than just the, the current one. So I am curious how they work that this year. I think there's, you know, everybody kind of points to free agency as like, or trade as the way to be aggressive, but there's other ways to be aggressive. Stockpiling stockpiling draft picks is certainly another way that you can be aggressive. And I think it's about finding a balance because Joe mentioned that they're going to try to win every single year that they are a part of their organization. You know, he's not here to mail it in. Like Tyler just said, um, it looks different every single year. You know, next year, the chargers have more financial resources theoretically, you know, than they do this year. So the ways of being aggressive are different. They're going to have to really rely on player development this year and making sure that these young players that they currently have on the roster or the ones that they're going to have on the roster have everything they need to instantly make an impact. And I think the the key thing this year is really elevating the floor of the defense of the offense. We know what the special teams is going to be like under Ryan Ficken. Um, so how can you maximize the efficiency of the offense and defense? That's going to be kind of the key thing from like a roster development standpoint mm-hmm. this season with the the limited resources that they have and being able to really hone in on specific types of ways to give them more chances at turnovers, more chances at explosive plays, and just really hone in on the ways to make them as efficient as possible on a week to week basis. Yeah, this is definitely going to be a team that is maximized in the weight room with their diets, with their training, with the facility, with the money paid out for food for whatever it is, 
I mean, the, the, the Spanos family, Jim Harbaugh, everybody's all on board and they're all in, you know, with their hearts and minds, of course, but also financially. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they do that and really, you know, make this team better. Uh, one thing I did want to ask about, and I'm curious your take on this, uh, on supporting Justin Herbert. I forget who asked the question, but they asked, you know, how are you going to support Justin Herbert? How you have Justin Herbert? That's great. And of course, George, he says, yeah, it's great to have Justin Herbert. One of the three <laughs> things that you definitely want. Um, yeah. but, but Joe said that we want to be strong, physical and tough. And we want to build a really good run game and support him with players that support the entire offense. What did you make of that comment? Because I think that was the only one that he really specified where they wanted to improve versus just like, oh, this is a really good roster. You know, we could do this. We could do that. It really felt like he specifically said run game and the offensive line. That seems to be something that they want to improve on this year. Yeah. And I think that's, again, kind of elevating the floor of of what the Chargers can do on offense. And we've seen kind of a, a dynamic shift across the league where the run game is now more important than it's been in the last five, six years. So you have to be able to get that aspect of your team going. And, and you know, I think that's going to come across several fronts. Offensive line, yes, definitely. I mean, they're they're most likely going to replace Corey Lindsley. Um, and then I think just increasing the competition that you have in that room. Obviously, Rashawn is Rashawn. Rashawn's going to be the starting left tackle. We know that. We know that he's going to be a great player. Um, but everybody else, in my opinion, has to earn it. And, you know, this is a different regime. This is a different scheme. Like, there's no guarantee for anybody outside of like the core four or five players, in my opinion, everybody has to earn it. So I do expect them to address the offensive line at some point. Maybe that is at some point in the draft, I should say, maybe not in the first round, but maybe you draft a guy, you know, like I was having this conversation about like potential, like Hortiz guys and, and uh, everybody in the Chargers fandom wants Jackson Powers Johnson. I totally get it. I think he's the best center in the class, but he's probably not going to be there. But maybe you get a guy like Graham Barton from Duke who can play center, guard, or tackle. Maybe that kind of player is the type of player that you're targeting who can say, you know, I can play multiple spots and we're just going to get the best five out there. And, you know, maybe that's him at center. Maybe that's somebody else at center. Maybe that's him at guard. Maybe that's somebody else at guard. Maybe that's him at right tackle. Every, every spot, I think, outside of left tackle is up for grabs. And I think that's the kind of, mentality that the Ravens that Michigan has has always had is is you know outside of like our core star players you got to come in and earn it this is a clean slate um previous regime and draft status and free agency status that doesn't mean as much anymore like this is everybody's gonna have to come in and earn I think that's one way you can cultivate that the other way too is we've talked about for the past couple years is tight end and the way that Jim Harbaugh has employed the tight end position as a real X factor of his offense, you have to be able to block and dig out edge rushers. You have to be able to set the edge, backside seals, all that stuff. So the tight end room is definitely going to look very different. And how that pairs with the offensive line is is super important going forward. Yeah, I definitely thought, I, mean, I think as a lot of Chargers fans have thought, I definitely did think Brock Bowers uh, at that point when I, <laughs> when I heard that particular quote. The running back room is also one I'm very curious about. I haven't watched this entire running back class. I don't know a ton about the current free agent class. Uh, there are definitely some more expensive guys out there, but I am curious in building a run game, how Jim Harbaugh views it in terms of paying running backs, how Joe Ortiz builds it in terms of, you know, views it in terms of building or getting running backs. Because as Arjun pointed out, they haven't spent more than 5 million APY on a running back, even when Lamar was on a rookie deal. So I'm curious yeah. if they do want to go get one of those bigger, I don't know if more sure names is the right way to say it, but a, you know, a bigger, I think more established um, former Pro Bowl sort of name, like a Derrick Henry, like a Saquon Barkley. Do they want to go that route or do they want to continue to be kind of what Baltimore has done and have a rotating core of guys that are all, you know, very good, very strong, very solid, just not a, a superstar by any means. Yeah, and I think, you know, they're the Ravens have always been kind of a, a pl platoon uh, running back team. They've always had multiple guys. Um, you know, the University of Michigan has been more of that kind of style. Even while Blake Corum is is lighting it up, they still always had Donovan Edwards like right there behind him, still being that guy. This year, they kind of had three guys that were were playing a lot of you know consistent minutes for them. So it is a position that, in general, in the NFL is becoming you know committee approach, and there's not that many like true workhorse guys anymore. So I would kind of expect them to 
take multiple bites at that apple. I would kind of expect them to take multiple bites at the tight end apple as well. And, you know, just really that the meat of the offense like has to improve. Like there's the current, you know, rendition of the Chargers roster cannot function in a Jim Harbaugh offense. Like you have to be able to really get more physical up front. And that's not just the offensive line. It's the tight ends, it's the backs, it's the wide receivers. Uh, Jim Harbaugh specifically mentioned like our wide receivers will have to block. Uh, so that is something to keep an eye on as well. When you're looking at draft prospects or free agency targets, like who can block, who is a guy who can maybe come in here and, and function as essentially a, a smaller tight end is, is kind of how you can look at that. And I think that's an underrated aspect of what drafting and looking at these guys can look like too. And it's no wonder then that Jim Harbaugh mentions Keenan Allen so often as one of those like three or four guys that just stands out to him. One, because he's potentially a future Hall of Famer and an all pro kind of yeah. guy, but he blocks. I mean, there was that rep a couple of years ago where he lined up basically as the fullback uh, on like a fourth and one. I mean, that that's Keenan Allen. He's that good of a blocker. So yeah, I could see why Jim Harbaugh be fired about fired up about I mean, him. There was this one uh, this year against the Raiders where he was uh, chip helping on Rashawn Slater and he laid the wood on Tyree Wilson, I think it was, of the Raiders. Uh, he's he's done that a few times. There, I remember there, the Chargers ran a crack toss, um, I want to say in 2021, and I want to say it was against the Dallas Cowboys, and he uprooted Leighton Van Der Esch, I believe, um, out of his spot on a crack toss, too. So Keenan is definitely willing to do the dirty work, but you need other guys to do the dirty work as well. Josh Palmer has improved as a blocker. I would say so. He's a guy I would trust to do dirty work, but um, with how much this team is going to run the football, you're going to need multiple wide receivers who can block. So, again, just something to to keep in mind there. Stephen, any other notable takeaways from the presser? Yeah, I thought his uh, point about the importance of data and analytics was really uh, valuable as well. Obviously, we've we've heard that he's bringing somebody over that's a, a data management. Um, that carried that data management role in Baltimore with him. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but th- his full quote on data and analytics, I think is, is an important thing because everybody kind of pictures like analytics as like the fourth down stuff and the game management stuff. And that's certainly part of it, but you know, he's pointing this out too, that it's part of the personnel department as well. Um, his full quote on it was um, certainly, I think it's valuable. I've seen the output and I've seen how it helped us in Baltimore. We're going to try to build that here. They've already been doing it. I've had a chance to talk to some of our analysts already. I'm really excited to work with them. We'll continue to grow that. Again, it's on the field. It's off the field. It's the business side. It's the personnel side. And certainly it's the game management and playing side, also sports performance. There are so many ways that you can use data to get better. And we're going to do it because it helps you improve. It helps cover your blind spots in scouting. You can have your favorites as a player. This guy fits what I like sort of thing. And you have the analytics behind you saying, yeah, I don't think you like this guy as much, Joe. You definitely have to use it. It is very helpful. So we're, we're big proponents of data and analytics. And, and obviously we have our guy Arjun is, who does a, an analytics feature for us every week during the season. Um, but what is your take on his, um, his positive outlook on analytics and how it helps him as a, as a personnel guy? I just love that it's, it's one more check for you just in case. Maybe it's a tiebreaker. Often for us, it is looking for, you know, between two running backs. Okay, what's the tiebreaker? But you really do want to use the film, of course, and the film is the number one thing. We just want to have that that check as well to say, hey, mm, I don't know if he's exactly, you know, who you think he is. I don't know if he's exactly the number one guy here. Could you consider this other guy who maybe has some sort of advantage in some other area? So I love that just for him. He's, he's willing and, you know, I don't know if humble is the right word, but humble enough. Uh, to accept the fact that okay wait you know maybe i just had a bit of a bias here well here's actually what the numbers say and and make a decision based on that not just the film or not and not just numbers or just a a bias or a hunch or whatever it's everything all together yeah i think the whole aspect of scouting and evaluating like the film is definitely like the most important thing but you have to check every box and he talked about this a little bit too in terms of like the kind of people they're trying to add as well so you're trying to get the film the person, the data, everything that, you know, physical testing, all of it needs to kind of line up for you to take a chance on a player. And there are certainly times where he has, and the Ravens have, you know, looked at a physical outlier and still taken that player. 
you know, they took a center in the first round. They took a safety in the first round. They took a, a smaller wide receiver in the first round. Those are not, you know, necessarily 100% data fits, but it's the film, it's the person, it's everything. And I, I think like, you know, again, the analytics these days has such a negative connotation sometimes, but at the same time, it's all a valuable resource. I was watching a film of one of the center prospects the other day, and I was like, man, I really like this guy. He's like, he's got some physical tools in him. He's aggressive. And then I looked at his pass blocking efficiency rate, and I was like, ah, okay, maybe not so much anymore. Um, so it, it all has to line up, and I think that's the underrated aspect of it. But I think uh, it, this is all going back to – the way that he wants to make sure every stone is unturned in every aspect of building the roster. And that's, that includes using data to back up their opinions and be able to look at every single resource and find some hidden gems that maybe aren't necessarily from, you know, an sec school, but man, this guy has a super high missed tackle rate or, or missed tackle force rate. Maybe this guy is great after the catch, but he played at Tulsa or something like that. You know, it's always a finding, an edge for your roster. And I think it's everything from Joe Ortiz for me is, is that he is going to look at every single possible way to find edges on this roster and data included. Uh, first off, apologies to Tulsa. If you're listening, uh, didn't mean to <laughs> shoot, shoot any strays your way. Um, but no, I, I do love the idea that the chargers are going to be looking for all these advantages. I mean, even throughout just this episode, we've discussed those advantages. Hello, it's 53 comp picks since 1995. Hello, it's 43 different transactions, trades up, trades down, trading players, trading four players, whatever, since 2011. It's looking at the analytics. It's having these discussions. It's, it's just, I, that's the weight room. You know, it's everything for the charges is going to be maximized. And to me, what, what maybe we'll never really know outside of just, oh, good player was selected. Maybe throughout all this, we'll never really know where each little bit added up. But I think when you start seeing the Chargers in the postseason being contenders, winning the games that they shouldn't, you know, be favored to win or they aren't favored to win, going on the road and beating that team and being a consistent winner, I think that's when we'll start to see, okay, like, I don't know where and at which point and how much each of these things added up, but they did. And the Chargers are a much better team for it. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of this and, you know, who like the resume and stuff that Joe is, like we can start to figure out okay, maybe some potential free agency targets, some potential draft targets. And I was very excited to get a lot of that intel from him and, and hear about his general philosophy and things like that. Because you think you know what a guy's philosophy is based off of like where he's been and where he's come up. But for him to be this upfront about everything was really refreshing. I, I love the press conference in general. Kind of last thought for me here is how he spoke about his relationship with Jim Harbaugh and also like how he viewed the Chargers job. Um, it, it, it felt very clear that this is a guy who really loved his time in Baltimore, cherished those moments, those relationships. And for him to leave, it had to be the perfect situation. And I think that really came out and how he spoke about, you know, the conversations he's had with Jim across the years about, Oh man, I would love to like, if you make that jump back to the NFL, like you're a guy I would really love to like work under, you know, he's, he's worked with him, you know, across several fronts of scouting and things like that. And then also the way that he spoke about the ownership group and Justin Herbert to him, he, he called it a dream job. And I, I could tell that it was a sincere thing that he really believes that this is the best spot for him to be a GM. And I think that definitely is worth talking about because a guy like him could have just stayed in Baltimore, had a great life, a great career. You know, he'd been there for 20 plus years, but he chose the chargers and I think that obviously the chargers chose him, but the, the weight of his feelings about how good this job is, I think is, is definitely worth talking about. It really feels that way that the chargers are that dream job and, and we're that, that opening for these guys. I mean, Jim Harbaugh has been courted by NFL teams for years now. And this past year he was courted by another NFL team. And of course by Michigan. And I'm sure there were potentially very good enticing offers there. And he didn't leave two years ago. He didn't leave last year, but he left this year for this job because he said it was a dream job. And he did cite ownership and previous conversations and things like that. Ortiz, same thing. I mean, you have the Ravens are, if not, you know, arguably one of the best organizations in football and have been for a very long time. Any team could have called him and he could have taken probably any one of 30 something jobs mm -hmm. over the past decade, but he didn't. 
and he waited and he waited for this job specifically. So I just think it is really cool for the Chargers to be seen in that light. And I think that'll mean something moving forward for you know future employees, for future free agents, that sort of thing. The Chargers, you know, even though they had a losing season, they're held in this reverence because now of the ownership group, because of Jim Harbaugh, Joe Ortiz, Justin Herbert, they have all these places in play, the pieces in place right now. I think I think t- players are going to want to play for these guys. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think you can hear the enthusiasm in Joe Ortiz's voice. I mean, he's uh, needing a towel because he's just fired up. He loves comp picks. Like this is a guy you definitely want as your GM, and I'm really excited for it. Um, I think you know we've talked a lot about alignment. This is definitely a day where you can feel the the relationship of Jim Harbaugh and Joe Ortiz playing to the Chargers' advantage. And this is really exciting, man. Like I, I love the draft. The draft is one of my favorite things about football. And having Joe at the forefront with his vision with Jim, I think is going to make this, you know, that much more exciting of a draft season. Um, Maybe not so much free agency. Obviously, they have some big decisions, but the cap space could theoretically be a little limited here. So the draft is really going to be the forefront. And then next year, they're going to have a ton of resources, a lot of cap space, a lot of draft picks coming their way. So it's uh, certainly exciting times for sure for on the Joe Hortiz front. Yeah, it's so exciting. I mean, even in the draft, like, the, the Ravens have drafted so well, and the, the idea that the Chargers can get a little piece of that is going to be so exciting. And the fact that they could pick even more players uh, in the coming years is just so exciting. It's, you know, we know who the where the Chargers are picking right now, and and Ortiz definitely did a very good job of saying at five, and we're currently at five, and, and that sort of yeah. thing. So he didn't quite mention too much about trading up or back yet, but they're not going to stay at every spot, I don't think, in this upcoming draft, and that makes it really exciting. No, I would, I would. If there were a prop bet of Chargers draft trade uh, on Chargers trades on draft weekend, I would probably take the over at this point based off of what Joe Ortiz was saying today. So mm-hmm. um, should be a lot of fun. Very excited to cover all of that process. Um, our guy Trevor Sikama will be back next week, and we'll you know ask him some questions about that. Um, one final thing before we leave today. Um, Adam Schefter and Albert Beer have confirmed that Jesse Minter, the former Michigan defensive coordinator, is going to be the Chargers defensive coordinator. So we talked about him a little bit previously, Tyler, but any uh, other extra thoughts about Jesse Minter being the Chargers defensive coordinator? No extra thoughts. Just I'm excited for the alignment that there's going to be from general manager to head coach to defensive coordinator. That alignment's going to be key. Yeah. Rising star in the profession. I think Chargers fans should be very excited about that. The Baltimore Ravens defense is kind of becoming the new meta of defense. So um, it, it, it's going to be very, very fun to watch that defense come to come together. Um, Jesse Minter is a big fan of simulated pressures, stunts, twists, blitzes. So they're going to get after quarterbacks this year. It's going to be a lot of fun to see how they exactly do that, how him and Joe Ortiz come up with a specific roster of choice. Um, but like Tyler mentioned, everything's aligned so far. Um, all right, Tyler, uh, any final thoughts before we head out? No, nah, man, just excited. Let's get to free agency. Let's get to the draft. It's, it's February and I don't know what to do for the next month, but I guess I'll watch some film. <laughs> watch a lot of draft tape. We'll have, uh, everything covered on our channel, on this channel, some free agency discussions as well. So hopefully you guys, uh, enjoyed the show. Hopefully you had a great time listening to the press conferences the last two weeks. I know I certainly have. It's a great time, obviously, to be a Chargers fan. So we appreciate you guys for all the support. Make sure like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Appreciate Eddie Olvera and Greg Kim for producing the show. As always, appreciate the Chargers channel for having us. And we'll see you next week. As always, hold up.